2018, the Estonian government launched free DNA testing to all citizens in order to improve health. In the first years, 100,000 citizens were um, got the DNA tested, and another 50,000 is about to get tested this year. And uh, that means that the Estonian government is the first government in the world to offer genetic information services to their citizen. And we are very grateful to welcome our next speaker, who is Lili Milani, who is uh, head of personalized medicine and research professor at Estonian Genome Center. Warmly welcome, and please tell us more about this project. Right. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to speak here. I'm really sorry I missed yesterday's sessions, but I heard you've talked a lot about AI, and uh, you've heard about the genomics revolution and the pricing of DNA sequencing and general DNA analysis technologies that allow us to actually start thinking of genotyping or sequencing large proportions of populations. So I'll tell you about what approach you've taken in Estonia. Although many different countries are launching the personalized medicine initiatives, the Estonian initiative is slightly different from what other countries are doing. As most countries are focusing on cancer and rare diseases, we would say that we've taken a more of a not rich man's approach, but uh, a more preventive approach, focusing on common complex diseases. And I'll tell you how we're doing this. So all of the work is actually focused around the Estonian Biobank, which was launched uh, more than 18 years ago. And um, by then, over 10 years, they actually had recruited 50,000 participants. And we'd done a lot of research looking into the genetics of different diseases because what was collected was DNA, plasma, cells were frozen down and uh, health records were extracted and questionnaires regarding health and so on. So this data set was actually used for research for many, many years. But then in 2018, we decided to take it to the next level and uh, we had actually said basically that we know so much about genomics that we could start returning results to individuals. People are ordering genetic tests from different companies and what they get is not very well regulated. So we decided to, to put something on the table that could uh, be the Estonian Personalized Medicine Initiative. And we actually then got funding from the government, 5 million euros, to recruit 100,000 individuals. And quick maths, that means 50 euros per person. So we can't even think or dream of DNA sequencing. But I'll tell you what we decided to do. Generally, the work of the Estonian Biobank is regulated by the Estonian Human Genes Research Act. Data is not allowed to be used for criminal purposes or insurance purposes. They all sign a broad informed consent form that allow us to update the records from different uh, sources. And the Biobank is really open for research just need to get ethics approval for a study and get access to data for research. Thanks to the broad consent form, we've actually been able to do electronic follow-up of the patients or participants. So over the different years, we've been linking regularly to the population registry, causes of death registry, cancer registry, myocardial infarction registry, and many other registries and the main single payer health insurance fund the database, the different diagnoses, procedures, drugs that have been prescribed and purchased and so on. So we have a fairly rich set of phenotype and health related data for all the participants. And using this data, we can create disease trajectories, what occurred before, what occurred after, a certain diagnosis. Uh, we have clinical lab measurements that are in some places very structured, in some places less structured but we're using, uh, working very close with computer scientists to structure as much data as possible. And the free text <laughs> records that are usually a headache, we've structured a lot of that as well and search for co-occurrence of terms, for example, a prescribed drug and the correlating side effect and so on. We've also done a lot of omics profiling. So as I mentioned, uh, we're focusing on genotyping 
which means that we're targeting a subset of the most variable genetic variants. But we've also sequenced 2,500 whole genomes and 2,500 exomes, which is the coding part of the genome. And uh, the rest are then genotyped. We've done epigenetics, we've done transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics on subsets of the cohort. The genotyping array that we used is the global screening array from Illumina. And based on the 2,500 uh, genomes and exomes that we've sequenced, we picked up 2,500 loss of function mutations in the Estonian populations. These are, for example, rare mutations that haven't been described in other populations and uh, other mutations in important monogenic disorders or, or in drug metabolism. So these 2,500 we added to your array, but otherwise it's a, a broad backbone. So it contains about 540,000 uh, genetic variants across the genome, just to cover all the chromosomes. Then there's a clinical content uh, for 112,000 rare mutations that have been associated with rare diseases. Uh, and pharmacogenetics and um, yeah, other monogenic disorders. And then there's some QC and fingerprinting and blood group uh, testing variants. So in total, we screen for 700,000 genetic variants for 50 euros per sample. And therefore our approach is that we combine these different layers of data. So when we have 2,500 whole genome sequenced from the Estonian population, and we have the 700,000 markers genotyped in all the individuals, we can do what is called DNA or variant imputation or long range haplotyping. So we can fill in the gaps basically. Uh, by statistical methods. This is of course always validated if we find something clinically very relevant. And using this approach, we have designed a personalized medicine initiative that targets rare mutations for monogenic diseases and polygenic risk scores for more common diseases. Because behind common diseases, there are hundreds of genetic variants. And using these 150 and soon 200,000 samples, we have decided, and we have data and research uh, protocols for targeting prevention of common chronic diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and uh, breast cancer, maybe more towards the rare side. Uh, we've designed a pharmacogenetics pipeline uh, using genetic variants that are known to influence drug response. And the last uh, part, the rare diseases that many other countries are targeting, uh, is not really part of this project, but the Estonian Health Insurance Fund has covered exome sequencing in the clinic since 2014 for children with rare and difficultly diagnosed diseases. So they cover the cost for the child and both parents. And this is really what personalized medicine is in Estonia at the moment. And based on the, the sequenced genomes that we had, uh, we found some rare mutations and we decided to do a recall study because these are biobank participants. They've come to participate in research. According to the Human Genes Research Act, they have the right to get feedback on what we have and what we have found in their genomes or samples. So we did a recall study where people where we identified mutations in breast cancer genes or familial hypercholesterolemia mutations. These are mutations that give you exceptionally high cholesterol levels and a seriously increased risk for cardiovascular disease or heart attack at a young age. Both have a frequency of around uh, 1 in 200, roughly. And um, what happened is that they get a letter where they are invited to participate in a study where we return results. Nothing more is said. They then have to come in, sign a consent form that they would like to receive results. And uh, a second sample is taken to confirm that the finding is right. And then they come in for a second visit where they get a return of results and genetic <laughs> counseling regarding the condition. We survey them before, after the counseling and six months after to see how they feel. They're also giving a letter to share with their family members, if they're mutation carriers, to share with their family members, basically as if you have been diagnosed with breast cancer at an early age, you'll be told to invite your family members for screening. This is something very similar as cascade screening. 
So get a letter to share with the family members to come in for testing as well. And for familial hypercholesterolemia, this is mainly caused by mutation in three genes, uh, the LDL receptor, APOE, APOB or PCSK9. And based on the 4,700 individuals with uh, sequence data at that time, we found 27 with mutations in these genes. Uh, then they were invited to, uh, they got letters to invite their family members. And then finally, we had 41 carriers of these mutations. They actually went through clinical examination by cardiologists and uh, got genetic counseling for, from medical geneticists. And uh, further, we looked at the outcome. So based on this, uh, we found 41 mutation carriers. And of these, only three had been previously diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia. Actually, half of them had some kind of dyslipidemia or hypercholesterolemia diagnosis, so it had been uh, discovered by the doctors. But only one third prior to the study, only one third were actually taking the medication that they had been prescribed, which is usually statins for cholesterol lowering. After the study, they actually found that 68% of the patients had some kind of pre or clinical coronary artery disease. And after the study, 66% agreed to start treatment immediately. 20% uh, had some contraindications, um, breastfeeding or pregnancy at that time. So hopefully we'll be able to get this up to 80% then being on treatment um, based on this genetics first approach. Regarding breast cancer, we found 22 BRCA1 or 2 mutation carriers. These are mutations that give you extremely high risk for breast cancer, around 80% lifetime risk. And although 19 of these have the family history of breast cancer, which means that somebody in their family had got breast cancer at an early age or even died from breast cancer at an early age, only one of them had been referred to a medical geneticist. Two had been diagnosed with breast cancer and two had been diagnosed with prostate cancer already. After the study, they all got genetic counseling and invite. Uh, letters to invite their family members for screening as well. So the conclusions of these two studies are really that there's a general unawareness of the familial background of these diseases, both among the population and among clinicians, maybe primary level care uh, specifically. There's a low pre-established treatment adherence for FH at least. And our major success around this was that cardiologists and oncologists are now totally convinced that we need to start a genetics first approach in Estonia and they are now driving this into the clinic, not us anymore. When we get to common diseases, uh, it's not that easy anymore. Uh, it's not one mutation causing a disease or a condition. It's hundreds of genes that are associated with, for example, type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease in general. And we've done so many studies on these different samples and we found that the effect size of each single variant or each single gene is very small. But if we sum up the 100 genetic variants that are associated with type 2 diabetes or the thousands of variants that are associated, then we get a kind of a polygenic risk score. And this polygenic risk score has some kind of a normal distribution in the population. Some people will have an average number of risk alleles, some people will have fewer, and some people will have exceptionally many high-risk genetic variants. The question is, do we see a higher prevalence of the disease among these people with more genetic variants that are associated with the disease? So... Back in 2017, we did a study on <coughs> type 2 diabetes, and you can see that the darker the blue, the higher the genetic risk uh, in quintiles. And you see that if the BMI is below 25, normal body, uh, body weight, the genetic risk doesn't get a chance to do anything. But as the BMI goes slightly over, overweight or towards obese and, and extreme overweight, we see a general increase both among in all groups, but you see that those with higher genetic risk uh, have a higher prevalence of the disease. But the question is, this is the prevalence of it. Can we predict as well? So how about incident cases? 
So looking at incident cases, again, the darker the blue, the higher the genetic risk, you see that uh, over just a six-year follow-up period, there is a several-fold difference in the incidence of type 2 diabetes among individuals uh, with higher genetic risk. And this received much more attention not last year when uh, the US scientist at the Broad Institute pro published a paper in Nature Genetics about polygenic risk scores for uh, four or five different diseases, where they say that people with the highest genetic risk are actually equal risk as people carrying monogenic mutations. And you can see, for example, the difference that people with a top genetic risk here on the right, 10% uh, of them have uh, coronary artery disease compared to 2 to 5% in the general population. So we've also done a polygenic risk score for coronary artery disease and checked if this actually predicts cardiovascular mortality among men and women separately. I'm sorry it's in Estonian, it's the figure, but uh, the red color are the individuals with 5% highest polygenic risk. And we see that 20% of the, of the cardiovascular deaths are among the people with the 5% highest risk which is four times more than you would expect by chance, and gets quite close to those carrying monogenic mutations. We've also done a polygenic risk score for breast cancer because only 10% of breast cancer cases actually carry BRCA mutations, for example. And we see that, for example, in Estonia, the screening age for all women starts at age 50. But in orange, you see it's those with 5% highest genetic risk uh, based on hundreds of different mutations. And you see that they would actually they reach the same risk as the average population at 50, they reach that risk already at the age of 40 or even earlier. So if we don't have money to start screening everyone from age 30, and we don't want to do it either, we could create screening methods that are more targeted to a specific population groups based on their genetic risk. And the way we're communicating this back to biobank participants is through counseling sessions they can sign up for. And so far we've counseled 2,000 participants. And we try to explain for them that the genetic risk is one. This is what you're born with. So even if you have a high polygenic risk, for example, or a genetic predisposition for type 2 diabetes, what you can do with your body weight is a lot. So... For example, this is a person with a body weight of 87. Actually, the algorithm is using your body mass index, but in the communication, we're using body weight and waist circumference. And we're explaining that what uh, 5 or 10 kilograms decrease or increase of body weight will do to your uh, total risk of getting a disease. And then they are given counseling of what they should do uh, regarding their lifestyle. And finally, regarding pharmacogenetics, again, there's a lot of genes uh, influencing how people respond to medications. And uh, different studies have found that more than 98% of Europeans actually carry at least one mutation that influences how they respond to medications. And these are collected into the pharmacogenetics knowledge base and the Clinical Pharmacogenetics uh, Implementation Consortium. They actually create and uh, publish recommendations for how a person with a specific genetic variant should be prescribed medicines. So we decided to take the genetic data that we had and all these recommendations and translate the genetic information into clear uh, guidelines for drug prescription based on what is published so far. It was so challenging so we wrote a paper about it. But Finally, what we did was then to confer, compare whether you had, on the, from left to right, whole genome sequencing data, whole exome sequencing data, genotype data from the global screening array or genotype data from another array, and how much of these different genetic variants that you could pick up. And the major learning from this study was that the global screening array actually picks up a lot of what whole genome sequencing does and it definitely outperforms whole exome sequencing because it could cover regulatory variants that are important as well. And these are then the kind of pharmacogenetic passports or reports that we create for the bi uh, biobank participants. So they find out which genetic variants they carry, which means that they are, for example, slow metabolizers for a specific medicine and would need slower do lower dosing compared to the average population. 
And this is an example from a female who came in for counseling and she had actually struggled with depression for many years. And she found out that she's a slow metabolizer for the gene enzyme CYP2C19. And this one she sees, it actually metabolizes escitalopram and sertraline, which are two very commonly used antidepressants. And she told us that uh, when she got these medicines, uh, they first worked really well. But then soon she started getting very severe side effects, like she would turn her head and she couldn't see and the picture is not following. Or, for example, uh, getting aggressive and agitated and different things. So I had to keep switching the medicine. And she was really impressed to see that, but this is actually written in my genes. I wish the doctor had this information when they started my treatment. So in many places... Uh, medicines are still prescribed on a trial and error basis and the amount of evidence that is now increasing regarding how much this genetic information can help improve treatment outcome, they can help save the healthcare costs and they reach, uh, reduce side effects from medications as well. So the final question is how do people respond? When we sent out our press release about launching this project, we got featured in many international uh, newspapers and they always found it, this ethicist saying that this is not good because people will get agitated and worry too much. So we did surveys before, after and six months after uh, the genetics counseling sessions. And uh, they filled in surveys in a participant portal and uh, I'll just skip to the results. So the immediate res response after finding out and getting counseling that you have a breast cancer mutation or familial hypercholesterolemia, the general response from all participants was that they appreciate the return of the results. One found it a bit difficult to say, which I think is normal when you found out that you have a breast cancer mutation. They generally felt calm, not too worried. They received the information they received as uh, they rated it as uh, valuable and informative. And all of them found that they received enough information. So this is a 40 minute counseling session with uh, medical experts in the field. And this is just a figure of the emotion scales that they reported. And in blue, you see the ones that found out that they have breast cancer mutations. And in red, you see the ones that got broad feedback about the type two diabetes risk and what they should do with their lifestyle or pharmacogenetic reports and so on. So, of course, we see slightly more uh, worry, tense and upset among the ones with breast cancer mutations, slightly less calm, but it's not that extreme as some people would claim. I don't know if this is something specific to the Estonian population, that they are generally very calm and laid back. We would definitely need to test it in other populations as well. But for us, uh, this is extremely good uh, results. And generally they found it all understandable, valuable, not too difficult to understand or irrelevant at all. So our future ideas, we can't counsel 150,000 or 200,000 people in our lab. We have about seven people working on it full time right now. And uh, it needs to move out into the healthcare system. So this is definitely our, our idea. There will be businesses popping up to do this counseling for people because they want it. And uh, our question is, like, do we actually need to do face-to-face -face counseling for breast cancer mutations and rare monogenic disorders? Yes. But for telling a person to exercise more or explaining the pharmacogenetics report, we're considering working with startups who do, for example, automated personalized uh, videos or just having a portal where people can sign in and, and play with their body weight, what if I stop smoking, what if I lose five kilos, and seeing how the risk drops, making it more interactive and online, of course. And we need to create some kind of a combination of these different options. So these are the different uh, collaborators in the whole project. I would say the major visionary between, behind it all is uh, Professor Andres Metzbalo, who launched Estonian Biobank back in 99, 2000, and... Uh, has been the one with very brave and big dreams and having bringing together teams that can execute. So thank you for your attention. If there is time for questions. Uh, so were there any uh, diseases that you would have 
wanted to uh, check for, but the, where the predictive value isn't good enough? And uh, no, I don't think we've hit that problem yet. We rather that we're a small team, so we can't do everything. Hoping to talk here to to experts and and pick up prostate cancer, for example, and and different screenings that that could be added to the the program. Uh, but we take it bit by bit, and somehow the stakeholders found that we have enough to start, and then we'll be building on top of this. Mm. Uh, and, and which, uh, p since this is a governmental um, program, I guess there must have been some political arguments ahead of the decision. How, how was, uh, what arguments were raised before you decided to? Uh, it was basically what do, what do we get? Uh, and uh, So the value of it? Yeah, like generally that. So it was... Of course, it was us driving it and, and uh, asking for it and asking for funding to start launching it. And, and once these five million euros was allocated, that's when the discussions actually started. So how do we actually do this? And we've been the, been the ones coming with ideas. And now that clinicians are part of the project and we're running clinical trials on implementing these different polygenic risk scores and so on, now they are the ones driving it. And we have a great team together that are think, thinking together regarding what can we implement, in what order should we do it, uh, and how do we need to validate the different approaches and processes and so on. Mm. So, and, and how, how long follow-up do we need before you can see if this actually had an impact on public health? And well, I think by the end of these two clinical trials that we're running right now, we will, we will definitely know. But the, even the preliminary data that is coming in now regarding, for example, a polygenic risk score for breast cancer, uh, is uh, already we're picking up young women who already have... Uh, cancer in one or even two of the rest. And these are people who don't carry the standard uh, monogenic mutations that are, are used in the clinic and they would be completely missed otherwise by the system. So we already see in this, by screening 300 people, we found 10 times more cases than you would expect from the general population. So I think the data is already coming in and the mm -hmm. people who are involved are already convinced that we need to move on with this. Mm. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Lily. You will come back uh, later yeah. as well. And we will uh, turn to our next speaker, who is uh, Associate Professor Fredrik Lanner from Karolinska Institute. And you will uh, talk about ge genome engineering, which we heard a lot about last night. And uh, you are working on that as well in, uh, in order to um, uh, cure diseases. From so... Welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been fascinating to be here uh, yesterday and today. So um, this is the main interest of, of my lab. Uh, the process that we've all gone through uh, from a fertilized egg, a single cell, to multiple cells that then mature into distinct cell types that make up our, our body. Um, we try to understand how this happens in a human embryo, uh, how the first few cell types are established. Uh, and for this process, we're using genome editing to try and figure out which genes are actually important for this, to get deeper insights into causes of infertility and early miscarriages. We're also working with human embryos because this is a, a fantastic opportunity to derive stem cells that still have the potential to generate any cell type in our adult human body, which opens fantastic opportunities for cell therapy, uh, cell, cell therapies. Uh, and in this arena, we're also using genome editing um, for another purpose. Um, although these stem cells can be differentiated into any cell type of our adult body, when you transplant those, there is the immunological uh, hurdle or, or obstacle that uh, the patient that received these cells, it's the immune system is going to attack this. It's going to be uh, an immune system that rejects this. Uh, so what we've been doing is actually engineering these starting materials, these embryonic stem cells, so they don't have the proteins that the immune system uh, recognizes. So we should be able to transport this cell into any person without having the immune reaction. Uh, I will not talk about my own research today. Instead, I'll talk about the opportunities of genome editing in human embryos or in germ cells to actually prevent disease from, from occurring. So not treating disease, but preventing disease. And I'll, I'll uh, briefly re review the 
technology, CRISPR-Cas, uh, that sort of uh, that facilitates this. I go through the history, how this has sort of gone from discovery to implementation into to, to embryos, uh, with the, with the, with the purpose of trying to treat or prevent disease. So hopefully. You've all heard about uh, CRISPR already. Uh, so there's, there's been an explosion uh, in, in, in this technology since it was discovered in 2013, or described in 2013. Uh, and there's been a lot of both scientific and, and, and public uh, uh, press about, around this. Me and other researchers working with this technology uh, were early on asked, is this going to lead to designer babies? Is this going to lead to that we can prevent disease by, by modifying the human embryo. And, and up until last uh, autumn, uh, we could say that the technology is way too immature, it's, uh, it's, it's not yet effective, and it's not yet safe to employ. So, so it's going to be years before this starts moving into that uh, arena. Unfortunately, already last year, he Yang Ku announced in November that the birth of the first uh, um, uh, girls or, or babies that have been genetically modified. So it's not no longer a future uh, uh, science fiction. It's actually happened already, or at least we think it's happened already. So uh, I'll review um, sort of the steps leading up to this uh, in, in my talk. So uh, CRISPR, uh, we've touched upon this uh, briefly, but I thought I'd just go through the basics of this. So CRISPR stands for Cluster Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeat, so quite a, a mouthful. The CRISPR system was actually discovered in really basic research, where uh, Francesco Mocha uh, worked with bacteria in these salt mashes in Alicante. And he found a peculiar stretch of, of DNA, which had these repeats, uh, interspaced repeats. Uh, and he and others and later found this another type of bacteria realized there must be a conserved function uh, of these repeats. And indeed, in between the repeats, they realized that there were small barcodes that matched to vi viruses. And it's then been worked out that this is a bacterial immune system against infecting viruses. So when a virus infects, if the bacteria has a barcode that matches the DNA of that virus, uh, the virus is going to be recognized and the Cas protein goes there and chops the DNA into small pieces and, and it eliminates the virus. It was then realized by, by Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, who at the time worked in Umeå, uh, that we can use this system as a programmable DNA scissor or uh, endonuclease uh, to go in and cut genomes. And this was then uh, further developed by, by Feng Shang uh, at roughly the same time and published in 2013, that we can use this to precisely cut genomes on mammalian cells and human cells. Uh, and this, of course, opens up uh, fantastic opportunities, both for research and clinics. Um, so the beautiful thing about this system is that it only consists of two essential components. It's the Cas9 enzyme, which is uh, highly efficient in cutting both DNA strands, and then target specificity encoded in this single-strand guide RNA. And the, the, there had been previous systems that where the specificity was encoded into proteins, which is really cumbersome to work with, and whereas designing a short single-strand guide is, is very easy. We can synthesize it, as we heard uh, of, of yesterday. So this makes the technology really accessible. So what CRISPR does, so the Cas9, then it recognizes a specific site, it cuts it, and then it's up to the to the cell to repair this. And this double-stranded uh, break can be repaired basically by two mechanisms. The first is non-homologous end joining, and here the cell glues up the DNA. And this gluing process is is not perfect. Usually, it introduces a couple of nucleotides or remo removes a couple of letters, and this will mutate the gene if it lands in a gene. So the gene will be inactivated in most cases. The other way that the cell can repair this is through homologous-directed repair with a template. So if the cell has a homologous template uh, that it can use during repair, it can make a more seamless repair without errors. But this also op opens the opportunity of introducing new stretches of DNA or, or changing the DNA. And, and actually, this would allow us to correct a, a, a disease-causing mutation. 
this is now rolling into somatic gene therapy uh, on, 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 a, on a fantastic scale. So modifying adult cells. So these modifications would not go and be inheritable to the next generation. Um, germline editing, on the other hand, there you would modify either germ cells or the early embryo so that this would potentially be mod uh, carried on to the next generation. And this is what I'll talk about. So the clinical application of human germline editing. When it comes to safety, and uh, the main problem with this is unpredicted effects on future generations. So that's what sort of distinguishes it from somatic treatment. If you treat the disease, that can be inherited to the next generation. But if something bad happens in this treatment, also that can be inherited to the next generation. Whereas if you change something in, in, in skin cells or blood cells, it primarily affects that patient and will not be sort of uh, extended. Um, the main safety aspects are off-target effects. So here's the worry is that the CRISPR construct would cut elsewhere in the genome and that cut may lead to another mutation that is harmful. Early on it's been, or perhaps right now it's more overestimated the danger of targets. We're, we're realizing more and more that off-targets are, are more rare than we thought early on, but it's still a, uh, a concern of course. What I think we should be more worried is on-target events with uninvented consequences. And this could either be that we're trying to correct a specific mutation, but we accidentally introduce another mutation into that gene. And that would, of course, not be, be, be good. We could also be correcting exactly like we're expecting to correct, but we just don't know enough about the genetics and we are unintentionally uh, introducing a, a, a harm because we just don't know enough about uh, how different alleles and genes interact. Another aspect that is uh, relevant both for somatic and germline editing is mosaicism. If you were to target a human embryo at the one cell stage, um, you have uh, um, the cell is shortly after that is going to divide into two cells. So if you have the, and the correction happening at the two cell stage, you might have a correction in one cell, but not the other. And you don't want that to sort of, you wouldn't like to transfer such an embryo back to a mother where half of the cells are corrected, the other halves are not, or possibly where you even have half of the cells are corrected, the other halves are actually further mutated. So mosaicism is, 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 is a big problem that needs to be addressed. Another argument that often is sort of discussed is the slippery slope argument. How will we decide what disease we can sort of use this for or what application we could use this for? In, in surveys that have been sort of deployed, there's, there's quite a high acceptance to use this for severe genetic disease. Uh, but of course, not so for non-therapeutic modifications. And this can seem like a quite easy decision, but really there's a gray zone in between. And where should we uh, uh, make this line, which is, is quite complex. There's also, of course, the argument about accessibility of the technology. This is inherently going to be expensive. So is it just certain countries, certain populations that would have access to this technology? Um, this, of course, needs to be discussed and who would pay for it? Uh, from a societal perspective, one should probably think about the fact that preventing a disease altogether in contrast to trying to treat the disease later on is probably going to be in the long run cheaper for a lot of disease. Uh, when it's so costs are, are also quite complex. And then I think the, the major sort of um, uh, discussion and also for, 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 from my perspective is genome engineering versus screening of embryos. So we already know if a couple have a genetic disease in their family, we can screen embryos after IVF and see which embryo is carrying this specific allele and try to ensure that we're not transferring that embryo back to, 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 give, to give rise to a baby. Uh, and for most genetic disease, we can actually do PGD. So there's a question, why would we need to try and, and correct if we can select instead? Uh, um, what I would like to emphasize there is that uh, IVF and PGD is not uh, very effective. Uh, if you're lucky, um, you might get, be able to collect 
say, 10, embry 10 eggs that are fertilized offered with an IVF cycle. Then approximately half of those will develop to a blastocyst, which will be ready to implant in the uterine wall, where you could biopsy. So then you're down to five. Then if you then have a, a genetic mutation to screen, then so perhaps you're going down to only three available embryos that potentially is healthy. Then the success rate of transfer and giving uh, rise to, to a birth is usually 30%. So the likelihood that you are getting pregnant is actually quite low from each cycle. And several couples may not even get pregnant, although they have the opportunity doing the, the, the selection. So what if we could safely correct the other uh, the cells? So instead of having two, three embryos, we're five at the transfer. So I think that's an aspect that would be uh, important. So it's not really CRISPR versus PGD. If CRISPR were to be employed, it would really go hand in hand with PGD because we need to make sure that the correct change has happened. Yes, next I would like to just briefly review the scientific uh, papers that have emerged in this, in this field where they're trying to move in and see, evaluate, can we do this safely and efficiently? And the first paper was published in 2015 by Chinese uh, researchers. And they basically just wanted to see, is it possible to go in and modify a gene that is linked to beta thalassemia? They didn't try to correct it, they just want to see, can we target it at all? The, the effect uh, or the results from this study was that the, the efficiency was extremely low, they had a lot of mosaic changes, and they had extensive off-target uh, effects. So it really illustrated that this is difficult to do in human embryos. It's not as easy as just translating it from a mouse or a primate directly into human. This paper, of course, initiated a lot of ethical uh, discussion and concerns, uh, uh, rightfully so. Have we opened a Pandora's box that we don't really want to open? Well, one, one aspect I'd like to sort of emphasize is, unfortunately, this study was not published in a, in a high-impact journal or really a sort of a prestigious journal. Instead, it was published here, and you can see that the review process, it was submitted on 30th of March and then accepted 1st of April. So really sort of question how much of a review did actually go through here. Although I think this is an extremely important paper and really sort of set the baseline. Then there were two more uh, Chinese papers come following on that sort of reported more or less the same. It's really hard to make these changes in a safe and effect effective manner. Um, both those papers. So, so, so they show that this is very difficult to do and it's far from, from something we could sort of employ clinically. Um, the next two papers that came started to try and address these issues of efficiency, mosaicis and off-targets. The first is another Chinese paper. This is a really beautiful paper where they use a new type of technology, a base editors, that does not cut the, both strands of the DNA. Instead, it goes in and selectively change uh, one nucleotide to another. So in this case, they could, they could change an A to a G, and this would correct the, the, the mutation. Uh, this, this has a lot of benefits. So since you don't have double-stranded breaks, there's less risk of on-target mutagenesis. You don't need a template to, to correct, which makes it more efficient. Uh, and this they saw, but they still had mosaic problems, that not all cells were changed in the same way. Uh, and that's not the way forward. Then the first paper from, from outside of China was published, and now it was published in Nature. Uh, there's, there's a certain correlation here that is quite strong, um, which we can discuss. But what they, what they argued was that up until then, most people have been injecting the CRISPR constructs at this stage, where both the maternal and paternal genome has been duplicated, so we have four copies to, to correct, and the cell is post, or the egg is post, to start dividing. So if the change happens in one of the four copies or after the embryo is divided, you're going to have a mosaic situation. So they instead injected sperm together with the CRISPR constructs, uh, which leaves the CRISPR construct with only two strands to correct, or in this case it was just one strand because it was a heterozygous mutation, and plenty of time before the zygote is going to divide. And, and sure enough, they saw much more uniform embryos, so at least really a addressing these mosaic issues. I should mention that uh, there's a lot of discussion around this paper whether uh, the, the conclusions from the results really hold, and there, there's a uh, quite intricate discussion here that we can talk later on if you're interested in. But at least this shows that from the first three papers which illustrate the difficulties, the next two are already making headway and making this safer. But the whole society uh, really 
felt that this is way, still way too early to sort of move forward. And this has been discussed uh, in several arenas. The first one was the International Summit of Human Gene Editing, and this was initiated in 2015 as a result of the first uh, Chinese paper. Um, and they, the recommendation then from, so this was driven by the National Academy of Science and National Academy of Medicine of US, Chinese Academy of Science and UK's Royal Society came together. And they said that clinical germline editing, it's irresponsible to proceed with any clinical use unless and until safety concerns are addressed and put in perspective to alternative strategies such as PGD. So it needs to be as efficient and as safe, which is quite a big hurdle to, 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 to reach. And then there's also a need for broad societal consensus. Is this something we should do at all? So both this needs to be, be addressed. And then they also uh, emphasize that there's a need of ongoing international discussion because we can't sort of decide on this in one country. We need to sort of discuss this around the globe. Um, this was 2015, we had a lot of progress, and then in 2018 was planned for, for a second international uh, summit. Now, putting it closer to China, where a lot of this technology is developing, they put it in Hong Kong, and just the days before the, the meeting was about to start, uh, He Yang Ku announced the birth of these two genetically modified twins. And I think the initial response in the first few hours are perhaps telling. In Chinese media, it says Chinese first, uh, modified babies. And the rest of the world said, you have done what? Uh, and then all of that changed. And I don't think you can find those initial headings in, in China. And since then, China is, of course, condemning this also as the rest of the world. Um, I don't know how much truth there is in that, but I think there, there might be something in this. So what did he do? Well, he tried to target the CCR5 gene. And the CCR5 gene is, is important for HIV to infect uh, uh, our cells. And there's a naturally occurring, occurring mutation called Delta 32, uh, which confers resistance to HIV. So the, the idea is if we introduce this, uh, that person would then be resistant to HIV. He recruited eight couples where the males were uh, HIV positive. It's important to know that these couples could still have healthy babies without HIV. There, there's, that's clinical practice to sort of to go through IVF and with medication and so on. So you don't need to do this to have children that are uh, disease-free. Uh, instead, he was arguing that this was some sort of uh, gene vaccination, ensuring that the children would never acquire uh, HIV infection. Ethical permits appear to be fraudulent, and there does not seem to have been any independent review of this study at all. And everything was uh, performed in, in, out, in utmost secrecy. He was scheduled to talk at this international symposium. Um, it was discussion whether he should be allowed to talk or not, but the organizer decided it's good for him to present so that the world can see what has actually happened. Uh, so, so there's no publication on this yet. Uh, this is just screenshots that I've taken while I sort of looked at that uh, presentation. So uh, he presented that they, they had a HIV positive uh, male and then a negative uh, female, a couple. They performed injection of the CRISPR construct together with sperm, so an ICSI uh, injection. And then at the blastic stage, they took a biopsy of three to five cells looked at the genome to see do we have off-targets and on-target uh, changes. Then during pregnancy at 12 weeks, 19 weeks and 24 weeks, they looked at cell-free DNA in the circulating uh, blood. And then they also sequenced these two babies when they were born. And what he's reporting uh, is that actually he didn't see uh, he didn't see any off-target effects at the, at the blood cyst stage in this embryo, which uh, the, gave rise to the baby that they now call Nana. They had one off-target effect in, in one of the embryos, but this off-target change landed in a region where it doesn't have a gene, and we don't know of a regulatory function. So probably it would not cause something, but we don't, we don't know, of course. Um, that's off-targets. On-target changes. So remember, uh, the naturally occurring um, uh, change is a 32 nucleotide deletion. What I saw in embryo one in, in Lulu is that on one strand there was a one base per addition, on the other strand there was a four base per removal. So nothing like the naturally occurring allele. Probably it's going to lead to the same uh, effect, but we don't really know that, and he didn't don't know that. In the second embryo, one allele is changed, but the other one is wild type. 
So we still have the wild type allele. Uh, so it's unclear how much the positive benefit that would give to, to, to this children, to this to this child. Even though they had these results, they went ahead and transferred both of these. So I would say that safety concerns, so if you remember the recommendations from the scientific community, safety concern needs to be resolved. They were not resolved, and actually I would say they were disregarded. They looked for it and went ahead anyway. I don't think you can uh, say that CCR5 should be considered as a suitable first candidate gene where there are no al other uh, alternative strategies available. The study was performed in secrecy without regulatory oversight. And the only encouraging aspect of this, if, if we are to try and sort of find something, uh, is that it doesn't seem like there were so many off-target effects. And this is something that we're seeing in other studies also. Uh, and he's not reporting any mosaic problem, which is really uh, quite sort of uh, remarkable. If this is true, we haven't been able to evaluate the data. Uh, so this is uh, a quite sort of sad note to end on, but I'm going to end here uh, and, and say that I, uh, I'd like to convey that the whole scientific community is really condemning this. Uh, and I hope that this is not going to be the end for, for, for research looking into whether germline editing could be a, a, an, an, an application in the future. I think it's important to have the possibility of evaluating can this be safe and efficient in the future. And then we need to decide is this something we want to go ahead with. But I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about CRISPR, that's, that's for sure. Thank you. And we will move forward. Uh, and we, one of the things that we talked about yesterday was that uh, science is becoming much more accessible to to uh, everyone. And one who has really uh, made an effort in this area is our next speaker, Bethan Wolfenden, who is co-founder of Bento Bio. And uh, warmly welcome to tell us about your experiences in this area. Thank you. Um, so, um, I'm Bethan, I'm from London with Bento Bio, and we want to make doing and learning biotechnology easy. Um, along with my co-founder, we actually started out of iGEM, which Andrew mentioned yesterday. Over the course of a summer when we were undergraduate students, we built a genetic circuit that enabled the bacteria to degrade microplastics, and it kind of worked. Um, and at the end of the summer, we we're like, wow, this was so amazing. And we want to carry on doing that. But at that point, we were kicked out of the lab. <laughs> so um, uh, Philip is a computer scientist. And you'll have noticed that synthetic biology likes to draw parallels between what computing used to be and what labs are today. Um, and we were really inspired looking at the um, evolution of computers over time. And we got totally fascinated by this idea of, okay, well, you can buy a little computer for $30 and start learning how to code. And actually, that's what Philip did at 12. He started to teach himself how to code. What would that look like for biotechnology? And this is our initial response. So we've built this portable molecular biology lab. It combines um, standard tools that you can use to take a DNA sample, extract the DNA, copy a particular gene, and then analyze it. You can do basic DNA barcoding. It's nothing fancy, but it's in a new format, and it's cost effective, and more so, we're saying that anyone can access it. We actually have people from researchers using it, and they're using it for sequencing in the field with the portable min iron from Oxford Nanopore, all the way through to people that are using exactly the same equipment in high schools. So it's really exciting. We've got researchers in the field, and then also 14-year-olds using the exact same equipment. Um, and part of this inspiration for the um, for the product was coming out of the DIY science, the DIY bio community. And one of the things that I'd like to try and do today is talk about what DIY bio or DIY science is. Um, last time I was in Sweden, I was at Stockholm at a biohacking, body hacking conference um, where for 900 krona they would inject uh, an RFID chip 
uh, into your hand. And then I was at the opposite end talking about lab techniques and molecular biology. Um, and there's a lot of different, uh, different terms for these different types of communities. And I think what I wanted to get across today is that this DIY bio or this biohacking, it isn't a homogeneous group. There are lots of different communities that are partaking in this. Um, but for the purpose of today, what I'd like to focus on is the people who are engaging it from a molecular biology point of view. Um, I took a look at the reports from the last couple of years, and it was interesting to me that two years ago there was no mention of DIY bio or DIY science, and then last year you mentioned it six times. Um, <laughs> and one of the stories that came up is the way that biohacking is kind of seen in the media. So there's this story from last year where uh, a company founder injected himself with this DIY treatment, um, and it caused a lot of controversy, um, and he didn't have ethical approval. Um, and this is just one of many of the headlines that biohacking kind of grabs. It's a bit like clickbait. Uh, and another example that I really like, and it's a very different type of application, a very different kind of approach, but is um, this biohacker that is looking at um, genetic engineering with dogs. And his long-term aim is to um, get rid of genetic diseases that um, have been caused by uh, um, breeding issues. Um, <laughs> and I, I wanted to share these because these are the ones that are like, oh, oh my God, what, that's crazy. What is this biohacking thing? This is really dangerous. Uh, and kind of come back to the idea of, okay, well, DIY bio, DIY science, um, it's this uh, movement that has been inspired by the maker community and the hacker community of you can teach yourself to build anything and you can start from scratch. And... Um, a really kind of uh, influential example of this is um, the open PCR where um, these guys built like a thermocycler for $500 um, and they openly published the instructions for how to make it. So it's bringing that maker ethos into molecular biology and saying this is, this is something that can be democratized. Um, and just going back to that point about not a homogeneous community. Um, so there are different groups around the world. There are different types of terms. And this was one of the meetups that I went to in Switzerland. And amongst this crowd of people that all kind of consider themselves DIY scientists, there are lots and lots of people with PhDs and backgrounds in molecular biology. There are artists. There are lots of sociologists. There's, we used to joke that there were more people in the room studying you than there were people that were being studied. Um, um, <laughs> and there's, it, it's really a big variety of, of, of backgrounds and of intentions and of interests. Um, and there are spaces around the world as well. Um, they're called biolabs or make spaces um, or hack space and bio hack spaces. Uh, this is the one in London. Uh, the London group, uh, more, a lot more armchair philosophists um, than some of the other groups around the world, and each space has their own kind of culture. So the one in a couple, the one in like California is a lot more entrepreneurial. People going around being like, "Your idea is that that could be a startup." Whereas, for example, one of the most prominent ones in New York, GenSpace, um, they do a lot around education and classes, and they offer, for example, um, I. Super like the clicker, uh, like a biohacker boot camp where they teach you the foundational um, principles of biotechnology, um, and they have a whole bunch of other classes as well, um, like oh, like looking at genetic ancestry and actually digging into that and saying, okay, let's look at how genetic ancestry um, is put together and let's really understand what's coming into these ancestry profiles that you see. So in the US, the FBI have been kind of quite involved in this DIY bio community. And out of that has also come these meetings where there's been these code of ethics put together by the groups. And there's actually two different sort of code of ethics. There was one in the US um, and one in Europe. Um, and I don't know if you can see the text there, but a lot of the, the words and the kind of principles that Stefan mentioned yesterday about AI, to the transparency and sense of responsibility come up in these code of ethics. So, um, but I was invited to talk about what are the risks and what are the benefits. Um, the CRISPR kit that Andrew mentioned yesterday is also one of those things that caused a whole bunch of controversy. Um, it was crowdfunded through a platform called Kickstarter. Um, and last year, I got involved in this email conversation where um, the German government had 
claimed that they'd found this toxic bacteria in the kit that was being um, imported into Germany, um, and they were they they'd put out this warning to all of the schools to say don't buy this kit, and they'd banned the Odin from shipping this kit um, into Germany. So there is this question of okay, practically, is the material dangerous? How do you manage um, biological materials, um, and how do you control and regulate that? Um, now, uh, it's contentious as to whether or not the those bacteria were actually in the kit. It could also have been a move on the German government to be like, we don't like this, we don't want this CRISPR kit in our country, and we're just going to block it. Um, but I'd like to raise that, actually, I don't think this is a DIY bio issue. This is a logistics. This is There are shipping procedures and methods for transporting biological um, materials, and these can be applied equally to DIY bio, biotech consumer products just as well as they can others. And this is this was kind of used as an example of why DIY bio or biohacking is bad, and actually it was just maybe a bad practice of quality control. Um, and actually, as a side note, um, the Odin are also doing this frog engineering kit as well now. Um, so the, I think the question is more, rather than is DIY bio safe, it's can it be safely regulated um, and um, practiced? Um, and we're really interesting... Um, example is that a whole bunch of individuals in countries where genetic engineering is regulated, where you need a license to be able to practice it, individuals are applying to the government for their own license to practice uh, genetic engineering. Um, so a friend of mine who lives out in Australia um, was very recently just granted um, the first certificate to practice genetic engineering in a garage in Australia. So she applied for that. So my argument there would be, well, actually, just like the rest of science, this can be regulated with the same types of principles that we're using. Um, but there is this um, desire to play up to the hype and the media and to, for this to kind of be inflated, um, which we as Bento are also kind of guilty of. Um, so about two years ago, uh, George Church also mentioned yesterday, a prominent geneticist um, described Bento as this Apple II movement. Um, and we we get all of these emails for people from people who think that Bento Lab can be this magic DNA box. And there are the questions they ask us are like, can I do an HIV test with this? Um, can I look at um, genetic diseases with this? Um, and the question that I get almost like a couple times a week is, can I do a paternity test at home? I want to do private home screening of uh, paternity. Is that possible? Um, I find these questions really challenging because in a lot of the cases, it's like, well, in theory, yes, you could do that. But uh, do you want to trust your own results? And uh, the idea of cost and the amount of time that it's going to take are very difficult to communicate. Um, that actually some of these projects are very long, intensive, time-consuming projects. One of the things that we do is we offer these uh, DNA barcoding genotyping workshops. People come to us similar to GenSpace, and throughout the day we go from extraction of DNA from a saliva sample through to um, let's take a 23andMe style marker and look at um, your propensity to uh, we have memory performance um, uh, or bitterness taste testing. And one of the things that's so amazing about these workshops is that they provide this great forum for discussion of what does this mean and where did this come from? So with the memory performance, you are actually looking at the genetic studies that showed these genetic relationships. Uh, and we had a, I had a really interesting conversation with one dad who'd done 23andMe, uh, he'd taken his wife's DNA and he'd done 20 me and me, 3 and me for her as well. She didn't want to, but she was like, yeah, sure, go ahead, do what you want. Um, and then he was like proudly telling me, but my daughter's data is protected because, you know, I didn't submit her sample. And I was thinking, well, uh, you've submitted both you and your wife's DNA. <laughs> her sample is out there. <laughs> 
Um, and I was having this conversation with Stefan yesterday is that there's this network um, on what people that are getting involved with genetic struggle to understand is the some of the, the wider implications. So your DNA is linked to all of the people that you're related to. Um, and these, these workshops, and I think one of the huge benefits or assets of DNA by science is providing a forum to have those types of discussions, to really engage with bioliteracy. Um, and I mean, there were some, there were some other kind of exciting uh, benefits as well. Um, so this is one of my favorite examples of one of our users. Um, he is uh, David, somewhere at the back, um, a retired chemical engineer who collects um, fungi in Wales. And he has started using uh, DNA sequencing techniques to re-barcode some of the samples that they're, class the, they're collecting. Um, and there's an issue within mycology of species having been incorrectly misidentified. So they're taking this technology and they're using it um, as an add-on to the samples that they're collecting um, to add in and include more data. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting example of DIY science because unlike some of the uh, the headlines that do grab attention, it's not so much a focus on we're doing this new technique in a different environment or outside of the lab. Um, it's, a, it's a value add to an existing biological practice. Um, another example is... Uh, a person that I'm working with in Australia who has a parrot and bird company. He sells macaws and parrots. Um, and he wants to be able to tell his customers whether or not the bird is male or female, which is a really, really easy DNA test. Um, and apparently it's important because you can't tell until the birds are late, other older. Um, and so that's what he's starting to do um, with, with Bentolab and with um, DNA barcoding. Um, so I, I think that actually there's also this DIY science where it's, it's just a biotechnology application um, a, within that person's own project or own company. Um, and that's something that isn't quite as sexy as doing CRISPR in your bedroom, but it provides a lot of, it's a, it's a step forwards. Um, there's also the example of just some really fun projects. Um, this is Gian Paolo. He did a project where he was looking at sequencing different kinds of beers. So he wanted to be able to create this map of different beers based on yeast. Um, and so if you said, hey, I like this IPA by Tiny Rebel, this brewery, um, he could say, okay, well, that yeast is genetically similar to the yeast that's also used in this um, Red Church IPA. So you might also like this beer. Um, now, if you're into beer, you'll probably be able to know that, like, okay, yeast, hops, there's a lot of different components going on there, and that's a much more complex problem than, than he's pitching it as. Uh, but that's exactly the kind of application that I think would be super interesting to see within the next couple of years. Um, and also, unlike uh, design a kind of genetic organisms, much more possible based on DNA sequencing and DNA barcoding. Uh, I also wanted to make the point that some of... We're talking about biohacking and DIY bio as if it's as if it's new and actually I would argue that although the term DIY bio itself has only been around since it was coined in like 2011 um, there's examples of DIY science and DIY bio um, that go all the way back. So this is the Gamata 50, which was a machine that used radiation to create genetic mutations. Um, and what I liked about this paper is that they also talk about making it available to high schools. Um, and this was back in the 70s. They were pitching this piece of equipment to sell to schools to make genetic mutations. Um, so it's easy for us to talk about all of this as if it's new, but it's been happening for a long time um, and we can, we can look back at that. I want to go back and criticize myself and actually to criticize um, the entire synthetic biology community. 
So in terms of the risks of DIY science, uh, I think actually one of the biggest risks that we have is the way that we try to explain the science to people who are coming into the field. And we use this metaphor of biology being technology, which is totally not true because we don't understand, we understand just a fraction of what biology is compared to the way that we use technology. And those these metaphors are helpful early on in terms of introducing people to the concepts, but I think that they're actually also really damaging because when you start talking about, I can do CRISPR at home, what can you actually do? Like the, the, the CRISPR kit from the Odin, I've done it. It's exciting to have access to that technique, but the end result is actually not that sexy. You get little white colonies on the on the plate and it's a world away from you having um your own tiny unicorn which is which is what you want right that's what you want when you do biohacking um and so in some ways it actually ends up being a really big letdown that you um that the, this promise is being made that it's a programmable technology and it's and it's just not um what we're doing at Banto as well is trying to think about how we bring people um, into that technology. So the infrastructure around the lab, um, we produce these kits for DNA barcoding and genotyping. Um, and it goes along with this learning platform that walks you through all of the different steps from extracting the DNA, setting up your pipette, all of that kind of boring stuff uh, that is actually really difficult to do when you haven't done it before, um, through to doing your PCR and understanding all the different tubes. Um, and I think that these are the types of things that are going to be important in terms of understanding how this technology works. And for actually, if we want consumer biotech, if that's an interesting thing, if we want that to be possible, then there need to be more people that are just getting started with the basics. And there are a whole bunch of other companies like the Odin, like another company called Amino, that are introducing people to those concepts in a hands-on way. Uh, and I think that's going to be really important in terms of um, actually getting to grips with what these, what these technologies mean and how they can be used. Uh, Great. So that's that's pretty much it. <laughs> oh, yeah. What would you say is the the ultimate goal of making uh, these technologies accessible to to everyone? I guess it comes down to a question of right. Should individuals have the right to have access to this technology? And my answer would automatically be yes just in the same way as it would with every other technology. I think that there should be cautions in place for misuse, but I, ultimately I think that everyone should have the right to whatever technology is created. Mm. Uh, you said that you had a bit struggled to answer this uh, persons who want to, to, for example, do uh, paternity tests at home. But what do you answer? How? Uh, we answer technically yes, but let me talk you through the process and some of the reasons why. Yes, but why. you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yes, but yes, but you shouldn't, or yes, but this is what that would actually look like. And this is, and in some scenarios, like with the, um, I mean, we say, I can't give you a paternity kit. If you wanted to go out and build your own, you could. I mean, I would, I would add these caveats, um, but we don't provide that. So the question is, the answer is always technically yes, but here, Here's some context around that. Mm -hmm. And and uh, what's the reply on that? Um, it varies. Some people are very disappointed we won't provide the reagents. Um, <laughs> uh, and some people go ahead and give it a go anyway. Do you, do you see that some of them have a very specific purpose? Is that the normal thing to have, that the people have a specific purpose for why they are um, want to have the Bento Lab? Or is it just... Or do they just want to play around? Um, for a lot of people, it's I just want to touch and access the technology and see what's being talked about and what's being discussed. Um, for some people, uh, it's I have this 
intense desire to answer this question, especially if they have a medical condition. Mm. Um, and then, as I mentioned with like the fungi and the mycology people, it's them saying, well, wow, this technology applied to my interest would be super interesting and I could see so much for that. So several different driving forces here, I see. Okay, thank you so much, Bethan. And you will also be back later. Um, yes. Well, uh, obviously, this whole development raises a lot of ethical questions, and we have uh, raised a lot of them and discussed a lot of them during these two days already. But uh, I think we need some help to organize our thoughts, and our next speaker will uh, probably help us with that. Welcome, Lars Sandman, who is uh, a professor and director at National Center for Priorities in Health at Linköping University. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to the conference. It's uh, really interesting to be here. Unfortunately, I, I missed yesterday, but I heard you had interesting discussions. And uh, uh, the first reaction when I got here was that, well, now we're so positive about everything. And I thought, well, now I come as an ethicist and, and sort of point to all, all the problems. But um, hopefully not uh, uh, too much. Um, I think, I mean, with the risk of sounding like the National Rifle Association. I don't think te technologies are unethical. I mean, it is their use or context of use that might make them unethical or raise ethical challenges or problems. And I think we should be a bit wary of what I call backbone reactions to, to new technologies. I think we see that. I mean, we see both very positive backbone reactions, sort of welcoming this as, as with a hallelujah, uh, but also the more negative, uh, and not least people in my profession, I, I think Lily mentioned that, ethicists, that sort of, oh, this is dangerous, etc. And I, I think what we need here is what I call balanced and sort of disinterested uh, normative analysis. Uh, what I mean by disinterested is that you shouldn't have sort of a, a preconceived idea whether you think this is good or, or bad. You should sort of take a step back and see, look at it uh, in a kind of a, well, as objective way as possible. And there are obvious advantages with, in this case, uh, what I will focus on genetic screening and engineering. And I think we have to acknowledge that, of course. I will focus on, well, three types of, of, of ethical challenges with genetic screening and engineering. Um, the autonomy challenge, uh, I mean, we are interested in, in people deciding about their own lives, what we call self-determination. Uh, and of course, then we have to handle issues around that when we come to these, these questions. Privacy issues, handle potentially um, uh, sensitive information. Uh, issues about distributive justice, how should we distribute or use the scarce resources we, ha we have, and especially if we, we look at this from a healthcare perspective, and, and that was, is mainly what I will be doing here, I will be looking at this from a healthcare perspective. And then, of course, we could discuss all these long-term consequences, and, and Frederick mentioned those. I mean, the, the idea of designing babies, uh, uh, perfectionism, will this lead to discrimination uh, of, of those people who, who don't fix their genes? Uh, the idea of human dignity, the whole discussion about enhancement. Should we enhance our, our sort of human capacities if we can, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. I will not touch upon that. Uh, it is tricky material and it is very nebulous and we don't have any good ideas where we should go there. Uh, just mention something about the slippery slope argument. I mean, the slippery slope argument is a tricky argument or perhaps even a fishy argument because what it says is, well, we sh we, maybe we shouldn't do A, which is, is a good thing, because we might later do C, which is a bad thing. I mean, the, the obvious response to that could be to say, well, let's stop before we do C then, instead of stopping before we do A. And I think that is something we need to take, take, take into consideration. And if we think that we can't stop development, then, I mean, the, the slippery slope argument doesn't ful fulfill any, any, any purpose anyway. So I think we have to discuss, in, in a sense, each technology and its specific use. Today, I will be the traditional ethicist. I will indicate a number of problems or challenges. I will not give any solutions. I think there are solutions. Uh, I think that's an important thing here when we talk about ethics. I, I know that my colleagues often raise challenges, and I think that's an important uh, aspect of our job. But I think we could also, I mean, by pointing to value conflicts, we could also see where should we go? How should we balance these values against each other? So I think there are solutions to, to a large extent.
So, starting with autonomy. Autonomy is often interpreted in terms of what we call self-determination. The idea that we should be able to decide and act in line with our own authentic, what we call authentic values, preferences. Uh, we should have the, then decision competence, etc. When we talk about some of these things, at, at least when we talk about the genetic screening, it's not just sort of perhaps uh, an informed consent to a predefined offer. Rather, we, get, we will get a lot of information and we will have to decide how to relate to that kind of information. And one of the ch challenges here is, is that even if information is generally very essential for self-determination, we need information in order to decide how to act and, 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 and in line with our values and preferences. It's not necessarily the case that more information makes us more self-determinate or more autonomous. Uh, it could be the other way. And we see a number of ch information challenges. We've seen within decision science that, that we have a number of so-called framing effects. The way we present information will make a difference to how people react. For example, whether we present uh, information in a negative or positive way seems to make a difference. Uh, whether we pre present something as a loss or as uh, uh, a gain will make a difference. It seems like if, if we present that you will lose something, you will lose your health, people are, are more actionable than if we say that you will gain something, for example. Uh, we will, we've seen that if we give more data, that will affect people's uh, actions. And they tend to be, become more cautious if they get more data rather than less data. Pre presenting risk in terms of relatives rather than absolute seems to be people act more on a relative risk information than on absolute risk information. And we know generally that people have trouble in interpreting uh, risk information. So, um, it, it could be also be the case that even if we have a sort of correct information, it, it sort of is stifling for information uh, or for action. I will return to that. Uh, and we seem to see that people can act what we could be viewing as irrational on information. We give them information and we, we have some idea that based on that information and based on their own values and preferences, they should be acting in a certain way, but they seem to be acting in a different way. Uh, and that might be a problem. So looking at, at genetic screening here, so these broad panels, if we have very broad panels with a lot of information, uh, maybe we need to have a discussion beforehand. What information do you want to, ta to, to take into concern and say what kind of information do you want to have? Uh, who should decide on that, of course? Should it be sort of the healthcare system that decides that we will only, we will only give a specific information that is, in a sense, actionable within the healthcare system? There is some treatment. Or should we give a more broader uh, uh, perspective on the information? How should we do with incidental findings? Uh, how should we do with findings of unknown significance? Should that be transmitted? So there are sort of what kind of information to be to 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 actually transfer to the to the patient or the person here. Uh, given the framings of effect, how do we present this information? Do we have to have a, a, a number of different ways to present information in order to, to understand it in, in, in a good way? Um, I mean, we might use the framing effects if we want to manipulate persons or patients to act on this information in a specific way. And that is something we have to take into consideration, of course. Talking about risk information, in this case, we, we have sort of a, a risk for something, we have some kind of impact of this something, and then we have a time frame. And of course, if we are given the information that you have a 90% risk of, of developing uh, a highly lethal condition in 10 years, well, that seems to, well, we, we should do probably something about that. But what if this will occur in 50 years? Should we still do something about this? Or how should we act if it will have a, a longer time frame? If it's just a moderately severe condition, uh, should we act on that? If it's a small risk for a highly lethal condition, etc. So, I mean, the, these combinations are, of course, sort of uh, might, might lead to different actions and, and, and might be more or less difficult to interpret for, for the person. This knowledge of potential future disease, even, even a severe, make, might make us avoid things that could have benefited us now. So, I mean, we've seen that if you get the information that you will de develop a, a, a rather late uh, severe disease, you might abstain from having kids, for example. Uh, 
and you might have benefited from having these kids. So it might seem a bit ir irrational to make that choice, in a sense. So how we do, do we deal with that? Um, uh, other types of potentially irrational choices, uh, I've talked to genetic counselors, and they have now found examples where, where people, when they, when they uh, find out that they have uh, <coughs> a gene for breast cancer, and get pregnant with a, with a, uh, with a, uh, a female male, uh, child, they abort. So that would seem like an irrational choice. I mean, first of all, we don't know if that child might, might have developed cancer, of course, but also uh, there is quite good treatment for breast cancer, so high survival rates, etc. So how should we act on this information, of course? And we've touched about on this information from screenings is of course also relevant for genetic relatives and how should we deal with that? I mean, generally the, the take on in the healthcare sector has been that well we don't seek up these relatives and, and give them the information. But I mean, it's it's out there and the more information we get and we see relatives acting on information, this information will be uh, have to be handled. Et so once again, there are, there are a number of problems. I don't think they are insoluble in any way. I mean, there are now models coming to, to handle these kind of information exchanges. And, and uh, Lily mentioned their, prob their programs with genetic counseling. We have sort of a long-standing tradition with the genetic counseling. But of course, the more information we, we get, the more challenging this will be. And, and the models I've seen are quite sort of time-consuming if we want to have sort of very broad information or broad panels, information from broad panels uh, discussed with the, with the patient. Another aspect is, of course, privacy issues. I mean, genetic information is, is now classed as sensitive information according to GDPR and for obvious reasons, of course. And we will be collecting and storage, uh, storing a, a, a lot of sensitive data here. Um, and there is, of course, a discussion, who should be the owner of this data? Should it be me as an individual? Should I have be the one who, who, who sort of stores this? Well, from a societal perspective, we are, of course, interested to, to get access to this, to this data. We can, as Lily presented, do a lot of research here. We can, we can benefit society if we could use all this data. How should we then view the ownership of the access to this data? Um, should it be sort of the... Healthcare sector so that, that's, that owns the data or has the sort of primary a, primary access, private companies, etc. So that's a discussion we we of course have to to handle, uh, and um, there are obvious potential misuses of this. I mean, you mentioned, I think, Lily, that you don't give this information to employers or insurance companies, etc. And of course, that's a, that's a potential use. But we, I, I can also see another potential use of this information. We have a discussion, and I will turn to that too. We have a discussion about how we should use our scarce resources. And one of the issues that often comes up is, should we take into consideration whether people have changed their lifestyles or not? Or if they have sort of problematic lifestyle and didn't change, should they have sort of a, a less share of the resources? So if, we, if you use the information that, that Lily presented, for example, here we have a, a high risk, which in, in combination with the lifestyle choice of, of, high, of, of, of not, not uh, uh, losing weight, we will have sort of a high risk of developing a condition. So we could use that information to say, well, you didn't change. You, you didn't change your lifestyle. You had this information. You were given this information. You decided for some reason not to lose weight. Uh, so you get uh, lost in the queue. I mean, it could be used in that way. Uh, and, and when we have scarce resources, that discussion comes up. So once again, something we have to take into consideration. So let's turn then to the distributive justice aspect. We know we have resource constraints. Um, we have what we now see an increasing gap between needs, demands on the other one hand and, and available resources, both in terms of, of uh, financial, financial resources, but, but also in terms of staff. And interestingly enough, when we look at this, you might think that it's demography that sort of drives this, this uh, resource gap. Well, it seems like it's not mainly demography, it's, it's perhaps more uh, raised expectations, new technologies raising this. And, and that is, of course, something that is challenging. 
And we try to handle this by, by finding some kind of principles or, or uh, aspects to take into consideration. We work often, most health jurisdictions of, of a welfare type, I might add, uh, try to distribute resources following some combination of, of what's the need or, or, or of this uh, uh, in relation to this condition uh, or this patient group. What's the benefit of this treatment? How cost effective is it? And we might also add other kind of, of uh, aspects like budget impact or the rarity of con condition, whether, whether this could be self-care, et cetera, et cetera. And we have some kind of idea of equality here. So we ha should have kind of equal access to resources or, or treatments for, for, for uh, uh, different conditions or diagnostics, etc. And of course, I mean, how should we then prioritize access to large screening programs? Here we have, I mean, there is a cost, obviously, uh, associated with this screening, both in terms of the testing, but also in terms of the counseling, etc. How should, should that be prioritized in, in when we have limited resources? I mean, one thing if we focus on sort of severe diseases where we can do a lot of good, that is one thing. But we, if we have a, a more broader screening program where we give a lot of information, we find a lot of information, even information about perhaps less severe conditions or smaller risks, etc. How should we do with, with people that still want treatment? Uh, is there a risk of over-treatment here? Um, how should we handle the worries? You, you, you mentioned that there might not be that much of a, of a worry, but maybe that will change if we, if, if we provide more information. I don't know. I mean, we, that's up to, to, to empirical studies to see, of course. But still something we need to take into consideration. Um, I think um, Frederick mentioned these, the, the cost of, of using these CRISPR techniques. We've seen now, of course, a number of new treatments coming up on the market uh, with a very high price. Uh, just to give one example, I, I work with a, a council here in Sweden called the New Therapies Council, handling recommendations for new, new uh, um, drugs mainly. Um, we had a, a new case on our table a, few, a couple of months ago, uh, a gene therapy for something called spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, and this was type 1, and type 1 means that we have children dying at the age of 4. So, and this potential treatment might actually change. They might perhaps not cure, but at least provide a long and fairly healthy life. Uh, initial uh, indications of cost from the, from the US context is $4 million per treatment. And of course, I mean, that might be cost effective. Maybe the gain here is, is large enough, a large number of years in, in good health. So maybe it's cost effective, but of course, from a budget pr perspective, that is challenging. And then we have the, the, the type one group here is, is quite small, but if we take into consideration other types of uh, SMA, we might have a, a population of about, well, 100 patients or something like that. So you realize that that could be a, a huge budget impact for a fairly small group of, of, of the po sort of total population. Um, so that is something we need to have, have some kind of idea about. And, and there's even a discussion within, in the pharmaceutical industry that how should this be handled in the future? Uh, on the other hand, if we don't uh, uh, provide these treatments or, or these screening programs, we have an equality program. We have a, a, an equality problem. So some will still be able to get access and some will not. And, and equality is, of course, an important aspect of our healthcare system. So that is also something that we have to deal with. Uh, once again, I think it's important to emphasize that I, I don't see these problems as insoluble. But we have to make decisions, of course, and we have to decide which way to go. And in this last case, when we talk about distributed justice, we have to have some kind of discussion about what kind of healthcare system do we want? What kind of treatments do we want to offer? And if we offer these new, very potentially good treatments, what should we not offer and have a discussion about that? And that's, of course, a, a, a tricky discussion. In conclusion, I think these new technologies are extremely valuable from an ethical perspective. There are 
of course, potential risks that we need to be uh, considering. Uh, but we need also to prepare for to how to handle these ethical challenges. And, and I think, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sort of uh, downplay my own presentation here. And, and it might be valuable to have this very general discussion about potential ethical challenges. But what I think we need to do is to look at specific technologies with, with, within specific contexts and uses and look at and, and make analysis of these and have a discussion and not just pointing to problems, but also finding solutions or, or suggest solutions for how to actually handle these ethical challenges. And that I think we need a process for because the, the te these technologies will sort of come uh, very quickly and we, we can't just sort of sit back and make a I don't know, a government white paper on this. Uh, we need a process for to handle the, the sort of constant ethical analysis in, in these cases. So, so I think I'll fi finish there and, and uh, leave it up to discussion and questions. Thanks. I was thinking, is there, do we have any good examples of uh, where we have technologies that we can use, but we decide not to use them due to ethical concerns today or in history or yeah i mean we we say no uh, constantly as i would say to to some new drugs for example because they're not cost effective or because they're uh, we don't find them effective enough or something like that so so we do that it might be temporarily be because it, it boils down a lot to pricing of course so when the price goes down we might uh, have access um but but that's one thing. If it's more like we don't want this, yeah, because of ethical concerns, is no. I, I can't sort of at the top of my head find anything that we don't use at all. I mean, we might have restricted use of this, of <laughs> course. Like, uh, I mean, when you, you talked about PGD, we have restrictions for how to what kind what we are looking for in PGD, etc. So we might mm. have restrictions, but mm. but not sort of. Totally not using. And yeah. We had a lot, of, which was interesting. I don't know if you followed that. We had a lot of discussion about uterus transplantation. I've been involved in that project. So th that was the, the general take at the beginning of that project from the healthcare sector and from many other was that we shouldn't use that. We shouldn't go there. Uh, now Saal Granska is, is actually probably establishing a center around uterus transplantation. And it seems that people are, yeah, why not? This it seems to work. And, and, it's, uh, it's and, and what was the backbone reaction? Why was everyone skeptical about that? I'm not sure. I think it was a combination of different things. I mean, I think uh, IVF for, or assisted reproduction has always been, been uh, sort of associated with some kind of backbone reaction of a negative kind when new, new methods come up. Uh, there was a discussion, should we actually put money on this when there's a lot of other needs? And also some kind of idea that, well, here we have cowboy surgeons and we don't like cowboy surgeons. So I think it was a combination of different things.